Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. Okay, I just have to tell you at the outset, this is going to be a long video. If you have any desire to skip the full analysis here, you can flash forward to the end of the video where I give you sort of the TLDR on what's going on here. Wow, what a crazy couple of days it has been. I have never gone through a period of time like uh, from Saturday to today. It has been, I'll just say it's been something to see. You know, on Saturday we had the assassination attempt. I had stuff I needed to get out, so I got that out on Monday. And then as I'm finishing up getting everything out on Monday, down comes the news that the classified documents case has been dismissed. So I thought, well, that'll be an interesting order to take a look at. And I find out that it's 93 pages long. Holy cats. That is a long dead gum order. But for any of you who may think, well, you know, this is just a Trump judge who is interpreting it according to Trump, um, I think you're probably wrong on that. And the reason I think that is because of the way the order is written. The decision is very, very well documented. And I think when you look at the degree of research that the judge has done, independent of what has been provided by the parties, you'll be surprised at a lot of this. So this is the first page of the order, the order granting the motion to dismiss the superseding indictment based on appointments clause violation. So she's not going to bury the lead here. Former President Trump's motion to dismiss the indictment based on the unlawful appointment and funding of special counsel Jack Smith is granted in accordance with this order, ECF number number 326. The superseding indictment is dismissed because Special Counsel Smith's appointment violates the Appointments Clause of the Constitution. Also, it violates the Appropriations Clause, but the court need not address the proper remedy for that funding violation given the dismissal on Appointments Clause grounds. The effect of this order is confined to this proceeding. Now, why did she say that? Well, obviously, because there is a similar proceeding with, a, with the same Special Counsel in D.C., and this judge is basically saying, hey, I'm going to let that judge make her own determination in that case. So let's talk a little bit about the Appointments Clause and why it is written the way that it's written, what it means, and some of the history. So one of the things that the framers of the Constitution were very concerned with was the centralization of power. They came from a structural framework where the king was the law. He was the ultimate decider. He had the power. Now, he had a lot of inferior officers, people who ran the courts, people who ran the treasury, all of those kinds of things. He had a lot of, of officials that worked for him, but he was the ultimate power. And as a result of that, he wound up abusing that power and for that reason, there were a lot of there was a lot of animosity, I would say, toward the whole idea of a strong central government, where, for example, the president would be similar to a king and could just do anything that he wanted. And so one of the ways that the framers sought to limit executive power, because they knew that creating a strong executive would create a strong incentive to centralize power is they limited what the executive could do in terms of appointing other officers. So the king had this ability to appoint people to not only create offices, but appoint people to them. For example, one of the offices or households of the royal order was called the groom of the stool. Now, you might be thinking we're talking about something that you step on, like a step stool, or that you sit on, like a stool in the kitchen, but no, we're talking about the stool in the bathroom. And basically, the groom of the stool was there. It was a high honor to be appointed to this position, 
no thanks. <laughs> and your job was to help, <laughs> help the king with his excretions and ablutions, meaning helping him go to the bathroom and then cleaning him up afterwards. I can't think of a worse job to get. It'd be like, nope, throw me in the tower. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a weak stomach. I have a strong nose. It's big. You know, it's got delta on the side. Anyway, I wouldn't want to do that job. <laughs> but apparently some people did. But, you know, the king could appoint a royal jeweler. He could appoint a royal tailor. He had the ability to create the office and then fill the office. Well, when you have a whole lot of people depending on you for their livelihood, their desire is to make sure that everything you need is given to you. And as a result, you have a great deal more power than you would if you had to wait for Parliament to decide that an office could be created and filled. So what the framers did was they set up the executive so that he could fill, with the advice and consent of the Senate, offices, but the only offices that he could fill were those that were created by Congress. So Congress created the Department of Justice and this position of attorney of a U.S. attorney. The position of attorney general is created by statute and the Department of Justice is created also by statute. But what's not created by statute and what hasn't been created by statute for many years now is an office of independent counsel or an office of special counsel. And so, if there is any way to salvage the appointment here, it is through any authority granted through something called the Exception Clause. So let's take a look at some of the legal reasoning inside the opinion. So the motion before the court challenges the legality of the special counsel in two consequential respects, both of which are matters of first impression in this circuit. So remember, the 11th Circuit is where this court in Florida sits, and it is the 11th Circuit that authority that controls. Now, circuit authority in other circuits, 4th, 5th, 9th, whatever, 5th is probably the most, or most closely related uh, authority that she could use, but all of the other ones are just merely persuasive. They are not... Uh, controlling. So the only authority is the 11th Circuit, and this has never been decided in the 11th Circuit. So she's the first one. She steps up to the plate, and she swings for the fences. The first is a challenge to his appointment under the Appointments Clause, which provides the exclusive means for appointing officers of the United States. The Appointments Clause sets as a default rule that all officers of the United States, whether inferior or principal, must be appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate. It then goes on to direct that Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the president alone, in the courts of law, or in heads of department. And, of course, the attorney general is the head of a department. For purposes of this order, the court accepts the special counsel's contested view that he qualifies as an inferior officer, not a principal one, although the court expresses reservation about that proposition and addresses those arguments below much further below, like around page 80 in this 93-page opinion. The motion's second challenge is rooted in the Appropriations Clause, which says you can't draw any money from the Treasury except where the appropriation is made by law. So, both the appointments and appropriations challenges are framed in the motion raise the following threshold question. Is there a statute in the United States Code that authorizes the appointment of Special Counsel Smith to conduct this prosecution? After a careful study of this seminal issue, the answer is no. None of the statutes cited as authority for the appointment, which are 28 U.S.C. sections 509, 510, 515, and 533, give the Attorney General broad inferior officer appointing power or bestows upon him the right to appoint federal officers with a kind of pro prosecutorial power wielded by Special Counsel Smith. Nor do Special Counsel's strained statutory arguments, appeals to in inconsistent history, or reliance on out-of-circuit authority persuade the court. The bottom line is this. The Appointments Clause is a critical constitutional restriction stemming from the separation of powers, and it gives to Congress a considered role in determining the propriety of vesting appointment power for inferior officers. 
The special counsel's position effectively usurps that important legislative authority, transferring it to the head of the department, and in the process, threatening the structural liberty inherent in the separation of powers. When the framers put together the Constitution, they were like framing a house. They were building a structure that would guide how the government operated. And it's a firm structure. In the court this last term, separation of powers was very important because it formed the bedrock of the case that overruled the Chevron decision. And it also formed the bedrock of the case that determined that Trump had immunity. And in fact, the case that determined that Trump had immunity is one of the cases here that I think is really at play with respect to this decision. Because So this is how the order proceeds. After laying forth pertinent factual and procedural background leading to the present motion, the court summarizes the legal principles underlying the Appointments Clause and the Separation of Powers Doctrine on which it rests. The court then surveys the stress... The court then surveys the statutory structure of the Department of Justice, focusing on the provisions which grant the Attorney General appointment authority. Following that contextual summary, the court engages in the text, context, and structure of each of the statutes cited in the appointment order. The court addresses the Supreme Court's dictum in respect to the statutes in United States v. Nixon. And... As the Nixon decision and record bear out, the Attorney General's statutory appointing authority on the matter of the Appointments Clause more generally was not raised, argued, disputed, or analyzed. At most, the Supreme Court assumed without deciding that the Attorney General possessed statutory appointment authority over the special prosecutor involved in that action. On that issue, though, there are compelling arguments in favor of principal officer designation given the regulatory framework under which he operates. The court rejects the position based on Supreme Court guidance. Appropriations clause challenges to the funding of Smith, concluding for many of the same reasons that Congress has not authorized the appropriation of money to be drawn for the expenses of his office. The order concludes there, finding it unnecessary under the current posture to reach the remedy question. So she goes over the procedural history and does an overview of the motion. And there's a lot of stuff in here that's probably not important to our analysis, but she says, here's the appointment order. On November 18th, 2022, the Attorney General appointed John Smith, or Jack Smith as he's colloquially called. The appointment order offered up four statutes, 28 U.S.C. Section 509, 510, 515, and 533 as appointment authority. The appointment order then authorizes the special consul to conduct two specified ongoing investigations and to prosecute federal crimes arising from those investigations. Now let's deviate here just a little bit and point out something that is a very important distinction. Jack Smith was not employed by the government when he was appointed. He was a private citizen. Contrast that with David Weiss, who is the counsel who, or special counsel who is prosecuting or who did prosecute Hunter Biden in Delaware. He was designated as a special counsel. However, he was already a United States attorney. He had been appointed and confirmed by the Senate. So there was no question that he had the power to operate as a special counsel. So if Merrick Garland had gone out to Virginia or Maryland or Pennsylvania and taken one of their U.S. attorneys who had been appointed and confirmed by the Senate and appointed him as the special counsel here, well then, there is a good chance that that appointment would clearly have been appropriate under the Appointments Clause. But that's not what happened. So, back to the opinion. Judge Cannon next discusses the special counsel regulations. At the end of the appointment order, there are following references to the Department of Justice regulations in the Code of Federal Relations applicable to the special counsel. Those are the special counsel regulations. They are in force today, and they stem from a final rule promulgated by the Office of Attorney General in July 1999 and later codified at 28 CFR 601 through 610. 
Notice of the final rule states the regulations replace the procedures for appointment of independent counsel pursuant to the Independent Counsel Reauthorization Act of 1994, and it cites as statutory authority the following seven statutes in Title 28, Chapter 31. So, Sections 509, 510, 515 through 519. Special counsel regulations consist of 10 sections spanning various topics. As most relevant here and explored more fully below, the special counsel regulations declare the grounds for appointing a special counsel, establish the jurisdiction, and authorize the special counsel to wield within the scope of his jurisdiction the full power and independent authority of the United States Attorney. 28 U.S.C. Section 533, cited in the appointment order, is not among the authorizing statutes listed in the final rule. Distilled down for present purposes, the special counsel regulations mandate that the special counsel be selected from outside the department, and then they empower that outside attorney to exercise all investigative and prosecutorial functions of any United States attorney within his jurisdiction. Now here's the interesting part. Prior to the promulgation, specifically from 1978 through 1999, there was a statute that expressly authorized the appointment of independent counsels. The statute was the now expired Independent Counsel Act. Are you catching that? Now expired. Under the now expired act, Congress authorized the Attorney General, after finding reasonable grounds, to appoint an independent counsel to fully investigate and prosecute. The legality of the Independent Counsel Act took center stage in Morrison v. Olson, a suit challenging and upholding the statute under the Appointments Clause and other constitutional principles. In 1994, after Morrison, Congress reauthorized the Independent Counsel Act in accordance with this five-year sunset provision. But then, in 1999, when the matter of reauthorization returned to the legislative table, and in wake of meaningful criticism by, among others, Janet Reno, they let it expire, and it's never been reauthorized since. So, there is no office of independent counsel, and there is no statute that appoints or authorizes the appointment of a special counsel. The court then goes to the Appointments Clause discussion. And, like all constitutional matters, when you're looking at the constitutionality of a statute, you start at the beginning with the constitutional language. He shall have the power, in this case Article 2 is the executive branch, so this is the president when they say he, he shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provide two-thirds of the senators, yada, 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 shall appoint, nominate, and by advice of counsel of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for, and which shall be established by law, but the Congress may, by law, vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the President alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. The Appointments Clause presides the exclusive means for appointing officers of the United States, there are two classes of constitutional officers, principal officers and inferior officers. Principal officers must be appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. That mechanism, presidential nomination and senatorial confirmation, is the default manner for appointment for both principal and inferior officers. But the Appointments Clause provides another means called the Accepting Clause. That clause permits Congress, by law, as it thinks proper, to vest the appointment of such inferior officers in three places, and only three places in the president, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. But any decision to dispense with presidential appointment and Senate confirmation is Congress's to make, not the president's. And the authority that they're pointing out here is the head of a department has no constitutional prerogative of appointment to offices independently of the legislation of Congress, and by such legislation he must be governed not only in making appointments, but in all that is incident to thereto. Importantly, the framers considered and initially maintained a proposal by which the president alone would have the authority to appoint officers. That proposal was replaced, however, and that's when they moved to this accepting clause. The framers' rejection of unilateral executive appointment authority traces its roots to the American colonial experience with the English monarchy and to the framers' desire to limit executive aggrandizement 
by requiring shared legislative and executive participation in the area of appointments. So, as I mentioned before, that's why they did it. And the Supreme Court has said, look, it's more than a matter of etiquette or protocol. It's among the most significant structural safeguards of the constitutional scheme. Again, because it prohibits the centralization of power. The Appointments Clause also preserves the Constitution's structural integrity by preventing the diffusion of appointment power and thus enhancing democratic accountability. Turning to the Accepting Clause, more specifically, the Appointments Clause requires that any congressional decision to vest inferior officer appointment must be made by law, meaning statutory law. Congress thus retains a critical role in determining which offices to create and whom to vest with inferior officer appointment power, and that role can't be usurped or minimized for doing so would breach the national fundamental law. So, pausing for a moment to distill the key principles so far, the following points stand out. The Appointments Clause reflects a carefully crafted system. Congress retains a pivotal role in the appointment sphere. And the Appointments Clause imposes a mandatory and exclusive procedure that must be enforced according to its plain meaning without exception. There is an additional background legal topic, and it concerns the degree of clarity with which Congress must speak when expressing its intent to vest inferior officer appointment power. In other words, can the Congress simply say the Attorney General has the authority to appoint inferior officers? No, because that's just way too overbroad. But what it can do is it can, by law, establish offices that he can appoint, or essentially it it can write a statute that authorizes the, the appointment of certain specific officers in specific situations. That's why the Independent Counsel Act, when it was approved, when it was authorized, when when Morrison decided that it was constitutional, that's why it was constitutional, because Congress had created the office of Independent Counsel. It no longer has that office. That has been, that, that essentially has sunset. And so, as a result, because it's sunset, there is no office to be filled. And that's the point, I think, that she's trying to make here. So Congress must speak clearly before determining that a statute permits deviation from the default appointment method and that it's warranted to preserve the structural separation of powers. So, Special Counsel Smith seems to reject the imposition of any rule of construction or presumption. Without purporting to survey the Supreme Court's clear statements jurisprudence, it's enough to say that clear statement rules have been applied as substantive canons of construction in various contexts. And then she goes on to list the contexts. Clear statement rules do not require Congress to use magic words or state its intent in any particular way, but they do require Congress to speak clearly, not merely plausibly. So, there are reasons to believe the application of the clear statement rule would apply to the interpretation of statutes affecting the separation of powers balance animating the appointments clause. Clear statement rules, as noted, generally apply when a statute implicates historically or constitutionally grounded norms that we would not expect Congress to unsettle lightly. The separation of powers norm rings strong here where the special counsel's proffered statutory interpretations would displace the Senate from its ordinary and long-standing role of confirming U.S. attorneys. So she goes on and she says the statutory structure of the Justice Department Attorney General's Appointment Authority. She looks at Chapter 31, Chapter 33, Chapter 35. She goes through all of this and then she says, let's analyze that. The court now proceeds to evaluate the four statutes cited by the special counsel as purported authorization for his appointment. The first statute is 28 U.S.C. Section 509, and special counsel neither argues nor that it establishes an office nor that it grants him appointing power to the attorney general. So that's how. 28 U.S.C. 510, special counsel Smith does not classify or rely on 510 as an officer appointing or office creating statute, nor is it. 28 U.S.C. Section 515, the third statute has two subdivisions, A and B. In A, the Attorney General or any officer of the Department of Justice or any attorney may specially be appointed by the Attorney General under law may, when specifically directed by the Attorney General, conduct any kind of legal proceeding, civil or criminal. And it goes on to list what the attorney can do. 
B says, each attorney specially retained under the authority of the Department of Justice shall be commissioned as a special assistant to the attorney general or special attorney and shall take the oath of office required by law. Foreign counsel employed don't have to take the oath. The attorney general so fix the annual salary of the special assistant or special attorney. Although special counsel Smith relies primarily on 515B, the court analyzes each subsection in turn. It says, 515A does not authorize the creation of any office and does not authorize the attorney general to appoint anyone. She goes down to 515B. The court thus shifts to 515B, where the special counsel devotes more attention. He says it gives the attorney general authority to appoint special attorneys like special counsel. This is so, he contends, because one, specially retained under the authority of the Department of Justice necessarily means specially retained by the attorney general, who's the head of the Department of Justice and vested with all of its functions and powers. And two, the terms commissioned and specially retained in the statute effectively mean appoint. And the history of 515B confirms that it provides appointment power. These arguments cannot be squared with the statutory text, context, or history. Section 515B, read plainly, is a logistics-oriented statute that gives technical and procedural content to the position of already retained special attorneys or special assistants within DOJ. It specifies that those attorneys, again, already retained in the past sense, shall be commissioned. It then provides that they are those already retained attorneys or special assistants must take an oath. Nowhere in this sequence does 515B give the Attorney General independent power to appoint officers like Smith or anyone else for that matter. This understanding of 515 as a descriptive statute about already retained attorneys rather than a source of a new appointment power is confirmed by additional textual features within the provision itself. So she goes through those. They're not really relevant here. I'll skip through that. If you're interested, you can download this opinion. Uh, It's out there numerous places, and you can read them. I didn't find it particularly informative. Statutory context. In the broader statutory context of Title 28, the use of the term special attorney within that context also refutes special counsel's untenable reading of 515B. Statutory interpretation says identical words used in different parts of the same act are intended to have the same meaning. It's also well settled that statutory provisions should be interpreted harmoniously, not in a contradictory fashion. After considering the whole statutory scheme, <laughs> after considering the whole statutory scheme and context holistically, 515 was created in 66 as part of a wide-scale government reorganization. As relevant to Title 28, that legislation contained two other expl- explicit references to special attorneys, both of which remain in force today, 543 and 519. 543, titled Special Attorneys, gives the Attorney General to appoint attorneys to assist U.S. attorneys when the public interest so requires. Section 519 directs the Attorney General to supervise all litigation involving the United States or its officers. The term Special Attorney thus has a known meaning in Title 28 that coincides harmoniously with the broader statutory context. That meaning, per 543, consists of attorneys appointed by the Attorney General to assist United States attorneys, which, of course, are appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate, a role Special Counsel Smith expressly disclaims. This leaves Special Counsel Smith to offer a highly strained reading of Special Attorney, which is that the term used in the provision somehow denotes a different category of Special Attorney than what Congress specifically created in 543. Neither the statutory text of 515 nor its statutory context gives any reason to believe such discordancy matches congressional intent. So she goes on and she talks about that. Then she says, History, the predecessor statute and historical use, finding little support in the plain language, counsel makes a series of unconvincing historical arguments that fail upon close scrutiny. The history of 515 removes any question that it authorizes the attorney general to appoint special counsel. The relevant history, according to special counsel Smith, shows Congress tacitly authorized or silently acquiesced to the use of 515 to appoint special attorneys like himself. Upon review of the murky historical record, the court determines that whatever themes can be drawn from that background, they cannot supplant the plain language of the statute itself, which clearly does not vest the attorney general with such authority. The special counsel's historical argument breaks in two parts. 515 statutory history goes back to 1870 and to 
the historical use of special attorney-like figures throughout American history. She then goes back through the statutory history and she finds that it doesn't measure up. It's not a good argument. And then she says the historical practice that he argues through American history amply confirms the authority. The court disagrees. The lack of consistency makes it near impossible to draw any meaningful conclusion about Congress's approval of modern special counsels like Special Counsel Smith, much less its acquiescence to Section 515 as a vehicle for such appointments. Special Counsel Smith's broad historical argument proceeds from two mistaken premises. The first is rooted in the notion that past attorney generals have made extensive use of special attorneys. This incorrectly assumes that special attorneys have consistently been appointed pursuant to 515 or one of its predecessor statutes. Some special attorneys were appointed by regulation, some were appointed by statute, some were appointed by both, and some, as far as this court can tell, were appointed without any formal statutory or regulatory authority at all. Thus, it can hardly be said that attorney generals have consistently drawn on 515 or its predecessor statutes as a source of appointment authority. The second mistaken premise is that Special Counsel Smith is just another in a long line of special attorneys. For starters, the title Special Counsel of fairly recent vintage, Special attorney-like figures bore many titles throughout the decades, special attorneys, special assistants, special prosecutors, independent counsels, and most recently special counsels. In the court's view, this is not an insignificant semantic detail. Moreover, the appointment of private citizens like Mr. Smith, as opposed to already retained federal employees like David Weiss, appears much closer to the exception than the rule. Now, nor is it true that special counsels have operated with the same degree of power and autonomy as Counsel Smith. Additionally, on several occasions, Congress has helped define and indeed control the degree and scope of special counsels. And perhaps more, most importantly, Congress, historically and in the present moment, has shown that it knows how to create offices for special counsels. In 1924, Congress did so in response to the Teapot Dome scandal. In 1978, Congress passed the much-discussed and now-defunct Independent Counsel Act. All this stands to demonstrate that Congress knows how to legislate in this space, and when it does so, it does so expressly and unequivocally. In their end, there does tend to be a tradition of appointing special attorney-like figures in moments of political scandals, but very few, if any, of these figures actually resemble the position of Special Counsel Smith. Mr. Smith is a private citizen exercising the full power of a U.S. attorney with very little oversight or supervision. And if we go back up there and we look at the footnote, it says the court expresses no opinion on whether these special counsels are truly constitutional officers. So moving on down, we look at 533. The last statute cited and relied on by the council is 533. It's housed within a chapter devoted to the FBI. And the court reaches the unsurprising conclusion that this is not a place where Congress authorized the appointment of a special independent counsel, because Congress does not hide elephants in mouse holes, nor does it shoehorn appointment authority for United States attorney equivalents into a statute that permits hiring FBI law enforcement personnel. And then she goes through the fact that officials is not synonymous with officers. That's an interesting discussion, but largely irrelevant here because she's already determined that he is an inferior officer. It may be true that in some circumstances, the broad term officials can operate as a catch-all phrase, but a statute's meaning does not always turn solely on the broadest imaginable definitions of its component words. So when read in its specific statutory context, 533 cannot bear the expansive meaning advanced by Smith. And she explains why that is. Again, it's not really important in this point. To be sure, there are many instances in which Congress uses officials to confer officer appointing a power, But in those instances, Congress still tracks the constitutional language of the Appointments Clause in a way that reflects officer status, that is, by appending some variation of appointed by the President by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make explicit that officials means officers. She says Section 533's placement in the statutory scheme compels a much more circumscribed reading, and that's what she decides. 533's heading, Investigative and Other Officials Appointment, provides an additional indicator that the provision is cabined to low- or mid-level FBI personnel. In response, Smith cites two out-of-circuit cases. These cases did not involve appointment clause challenges. Special Counsel Smith's interpretation undermines the separation of powers principles that animate the appointments clause and destabilizes 
Congress's carefully crafted statutory structure for DOJ. And that's important. Absent a statute vesting appointment power elsewhere, the default manner of appointment for inferior officers is presidential nomination and Senate confirmation, which didn't happen here. United States versus Nixon. The parties disagree about the presidential value of a passage from U.S. versus Nixon. And here's that passage. Under the authority of Article 2, Section 2, Congress has vested the Attorney General the power to conduct the criminal litigation of the United States government. It has also vested in him the power to appoint subordinate officers to assist him in the discharge of his duties. Acting pursuant to those statutes, the Attorney General has delegated the authority to represent the U.S. in these matters to a special prosecutors with unique authority and tenure. That, that regulation gives the special prosecutor explicit power to contest the invocation of executive privilege in the process of seeking evidence deemed relevant to the performance of these specially delegated duties. Defendants argue that Nixon's statement about the Attorney General's statutory authority is non-binding dictum and should not control. Following a comprehensive review of the Supreme Court record, now let's look at that footnote, footnote 46. The court collected and reviewed all available filings in U.S. v. Nixon. This includes the applicable cert petitions and merits briefing, along with amicus briefs, the full appendix, and the consolidated oral argument transcript. Oral argument, United States versus Nixon. So the, the judge here did independent research and went through the entire file from the Supreme Court on Nixon versus United States. And you may recall earlier that she made this observation. As the Nixon decision and record bear out, the Attorney General's statutory appointment authority, or the matter of the appointments clause more generally, was not raised, argued, disputed, or analyzed by the Supreme Court in that case. And she says, giving these remarks precedential weight runs the risk that stray language from the Nixon opinion will take on importance in a new context that its drafters could not have anticipated. Legal standards. Not she goes through this and makes the case pretty eloquently that the analysis and the information presented in the Nixon opinion is indeed dicta. She does that by saying the appointment authority was not at issue before the Supreme Court in Nixon. The special prosecutor's validity was uncontested. The court's statement on Attorney General's authority was not necessary to the resolution of the justice ability issue. In that case, as dictum, Nixon's statement is unpersuasive, and Nixon did not analyze the relevant statutes. Nixon was decided prior to the development of recent appointments clause jurisprudence, and out-of-circuit cases cited by special counsel are equally unimpressive. So then she goes down to principal versus inferior office des designations, and she says that he claims he's an inferior officer, not a principal officer. Defendants and Mies, Amiki, contest this assertion, and it's, worth a, it's a point worthy of consideration given the virtually unchecked power given to him under the regulations. Ultimately, however, after examining the broad language in the Supreme Court cases on the subject and seeing a mixed picture, even if a compelling one in favor of principal designation, the court elects with reservations to reject the principal officer's submission and leave the matter for review by higher courts. So she goes through the arguments by the parties, and one of the things that's important is she talks about the fact that he supposedly is supervised, so he's an inferior officer. He has a supervisor, and that supervisor would be the attorney general. But when he was asked, he was quite cagey about it. The court expresses some hesitation in this regard and lacks a detailed understanding of the actual extent and mechanics of supervision and control over special counsel Smith. Nevertheless, neither party pressed for an evidentiary hearing on the appointments clause issue. The special counsel appears to have taken the questionable position that such inquiries intrude upon privileged department deliberations, and the court generally agrees that the judicial treatment of appointments clause challenges has tracked the level of supervision and direction by reference to statutes and or regulations only. So the court thus proceeds accordingly, referencing the regulatory framework in effect at the time of the subject appointment order, and the regulations impose almost no supervision or direction over the special counsel and give him broad power to render final decisions on behalf of the United States. So 
It looks to me like he's much more of a principal officer than an inferior officer. He claims he's inferior. Um, and obviously, there you could find it either way. And I think that's essentially what the court's saying. First, as a special counsel, he's under no up regulatory obligation to consult with the AG about the conduct of his duties. A special counsel must comply with the rules and regulations, and he has to consult with appropriate offices within the department for guidance. He still has, on the subject consultation, the regulations give full discretion to the special counsel to consult directly with the attorney general, even when the special counsel concludes that the extraordinary circumstance of any particular decision would render compliance with required review and approval procedures by designated department component inappropriate. Fourth, turning to mechanisms for notification between special counsel and attorney general, the regulations require the special counsel to notify the AG of events in the course of his or her investigation in conformity with departmental guidelines. So while there is some supervision, fifth and finally, the regulations expressly remove day-to-day -day supervision and provide almost counter no countermanding authority for the attorney general. The provision reduced to its essence leaves the attorney general a very slim route to countermand the decision by the special counsel, but only when the decision is so inappropriate or unwarranted under established policies, only after the attorney general is given as a mandatory matter great weight to the views of the special counsel and subject to a strict congressional notification requirement that mandates the attorney general notify Congress of his countermanding decision. So, in sum, this framework does not lend itself to a finding that special counsel Smith's work is directed and supervised at some level by the AG, unless that at some level qualifier in Redmond is read exceedingly broad. The limitation on the attorney general's power to remove special counsel support principal status under Edmund, but maybe not under Morrison. So there's a conflict in the case law. She goes through that. The possibility of a future rescission of special counsel regulations to create at-will removal doesn't change the Appointments Clause inquiry under the current law. So, the regulatory cherry-picking seems questionable as a means to resolve the inferior principal appointments question. Although the court admits of uncertainty in this regard, and some courts have accepted the revocability piece as crucial. Nevertheless, she doesn't really make that determination. The special counsel's defined jurisdiction and tenure present a mixed and candidly unhelpful picture. In some degree, the special counsel's powers are argu arguably broader than a traditional U.S. attorney, and he's permitted to exercise his investigative powers across multiple districts within the same investigation. So this is a really interesting and really long opinion. We are at page 79 of a 93-page opinion, and I'm going to stop right here because there isn't any reason to go further. She makes the determination that it violates the Appointments Clause, and as a result, she throws out the indictment. Now, up to this point, Jack Smith has been filing actions in the court as special counsel. But she has now said, your appointment is unlawful. You actually have no authority. And at least in this court, it's arguable that Smith can't even file an appeal because he has no statutory authority to file an appeal. And while he might very well contest that the judge has this wrong, the court would be within its prerogative to deny him the right to file an appeal in this case, and he would essentially have to rely on the U.S. attorney in Miami to come in and intervene. Smith would have to get the U.S. attorney from Miami to come in and file a motion to intervene which, of course, would be opposed by the defendants. If the judge granted the motion to intervene, then the U.S. attorney could file a motion for leave to file an appeal of the decision. And the U.S. Department of Justice then could use its attorneys to file an appeal. But Jack Smith, as of this point, in Florida anyway, has been knocked off of his horse. And that's an important distinction. When someone says you have neither the authority as provided by the Constitution nor the funding as required by Congress to proceed in this matter, you're out to lunch. Sorry about that, Charlie. So that's the, the long and short of this case. There is no more case in Florida. And if there was going to be another case, it would have to be indicted by a U.S. attorney 
And then you would have all kinds of assertions of political vendetta and that sort of thing. The reason for an appointment of special counsel, of course, is to, to make it at least appear that there is an independent person who doesn't you know, rely on the good graces of the current administration to keep his job. That person is appointed to exercise independent authority. If that is no longer authorized by the statutes or by the Constitution, then the only people who can take that step is the U.S. attorneys, and the U.S. attorneys are directly under the control of Merrick Garland, who is directly under control of the Biden administration. And you can be assured that there would be many, many more uh, assertions that this is a political hit job. Now, as I've been on the record before, I think of all of Trump's violations or alleg alleged violations, maybe that's the better way to say it, of all of Trump's alleged violations, this was the most serious. These were very serious allegations that were essentially putting our national security at risk. And as a result of that, I think the government certainly has the ability to move forward with it if they want to. The only question is how they go about fixing the problem that they now find themselves mired in. So this has been a really long one, and I apologize for that, but there was a really long opinion, and I felt like it all had some really good stuff that we needed to talk about. You're going to have questions, and if you would, in this case, put special counsel in the uh, video request form or in, in the email subject line and ask me what your questions are via email so that I can take these emails and put together a list of questions and then do another video and try to answer some of those questions. I tried to cover as much of this as I could, but again, you're limited in time. I mean, this could be a three-hour dissertation if we let it be. Okay, here is the TLDR in this case. First of all, the Appointments Clause requires someone to be nominated by the President and appoint and confirmed by the Senate. That didn't happen. That requirement applies whether it's a principal officer or an inferior officer. However, certain inferior officers can be appointed to positions created by law by department heads under the accepting clause of Article 2. The court here makes the determination that the office has not been appointed by law. It hasn't been established by Congress as special counsel or independent counsel. And because that office has not been established by law and the statutes that the special counsel relied on do not establish an office at law, the appointments clause is violated. The indictment has to be stricken and the case dismissed. It's a very long opinion, but I believe it is the correct analysis in this case just because of the way the Appointments Clause is part of the structure of the separation of powers. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments down below. Like, share, subscribe, you know, all that stuff we ask you to do. And if you would, now take a moment to reflect that you live in the greatest country in the world. That in spite of the many differences of opinion that people will have about the propriety of this ruling, the ruling was reached by an independent judiciary after thorough analysis. It may be wrong, but it does not appear to me that she made any significant mistakes. It's just a matter of essentially ferreting out this difference between principal officers and inferior officers and whether or not the office was established by law. And of course, Justice Thomas at the Supreme Court had already opined that the special counsel's appointment was unlawful. So we'll have to see how things go. Do a kindness for somebody today if you have the opportunity, and then come on back tomorrow, catch me at the beach. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.